what are we made of? We are made of elements. We are made of different kinds of tissues, blood, bones. What are they really made of? Atomic elements. But where are they really made of? Well, what could surprise you is that we are made of stars. Everything we see, the oxygen in our lungs, the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, has been made in stars. Carl Sagan put it very nicely. We are made of star stuff. <laughs> now, everywhere we look in the universe, the same elements we would find out there as we find in Earth. Now, the big question for nuclear astrophysicists is, at the end of the day, how are these elements made? This has been at the study of nuclear physics for several decades. And we still don't know how this is working. So the first thing is then to take a look at the universe and compare how much of an element is there with respect of another. So it, that's what we call the element abundances. They follow a strange pattern. In red, I have highlighted the elements or some elements that are important to sustain life and also some elements that you will think are interesting. Silver, gold, lead. Now, suppose that you are interested in gold. Why there is, why is there out uh, much more um, hydrogen? Oops, this is going the way, other way around. Okay, why is there more hydrogen compared to gold? And if you want to make gold in a lab, how do you make it? Well, this is related to eccentric stars. And I'm not talking about Michael Jackson or Lady Gaga. Okay, I'm talking about neutron stars. These stars have a very extreme properties. For example, they are mainly made of neutrons. An object mainly made of neutrons. That's pretty much what happened to a heavy elements like gold. We have there more neutrons than protons. So we think of the neutron star as the biggest nucleus out there. Now, the thing is that they have extreme magnetic fields. They have magnetic fields that are billion times larger than the magnetic field of Earth. That means that if a neutron star was passing halfway between the Earth and the Moon, all the credit cards will stop working immediately. They are also very dense. So dense. Can you think about the densest element you know? Lead? Well, a neutron star is a trillion times denser than lead. Let me give you an idea how dense they can be. The radius is 14 kilometers. That's pretty much the distance between downtown Guelph and the 401. Now consider the mass. Their mass is similar to the mass of the sun. Pack all that mass in that little radius. A neutron star is pretty much the size of Guelph. And it has the, sun, the mass of the sun. That's certainly extreme. Now, if you think that that's extreme, can you imagine what would happen if two neutron stars encounter each other? This is illustrated in this artistic conception. As the stars getting closer and closer to each other, they're going to start spinning faster and faster. Now, this is going to accumulate a lot of energy. They get closer, and that mass is going to become one single object. Then, the mass, the energy, has to be liberated somehow. Some mass is going to be ejected, and some energy is going to be transferred to heat. It's going to be transferred to light, and very importantly, to some particles that we call neutrinos. Neutrinos are very special. They almost don't interact with anything. That means they are transparent. At the end, what we're going to have is a black hole surrounded by the leftovers of this encounter. Accretion disk, we call it. In the process, neutrinos are going to be ejected. Matter is going to be ejected. Neutrinos will get mixed with the neutrons and protons of that matter that has been ejected. And as they cool down, they're going to start making new elements, gold, 
here you go, your heavy elements. Now, the question I pose is, does this, this, this black hole has anything to do with how much gold we find in the universe? Does the, the black hole tell me anything about if heavy elements are being processed or not? What kind of elements we are? That's exactly the question I pose. So I do think so. And I'm going to try to explain why. A century ago, Albert Einstein proposed the following. He revolutionized the way that we think about space and time. Before him, we used to think that space and time were completely uncorrelated. They didn't know about each other and that nothing would change them. That's what we call flat space. Now, Einstein thought, okay, if we put mass, if we have a mass distribution, that is going to change space and time. They are correlated. And if there's any change in that mass, then it's going to produce perturbations in space time. That's what we call now gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are going to just travel in time and space. The thing is that he thought, he acknowledged, those vibrations, those gravitational waves, are going to be insignificant for us to perceive in our everyday life. 2016 is going to be remembered in the history of physics as the first time that we have observational evidence of the existence of gravitational waves. This first observation occurred because there were two black holes billions of light years away from us that encountered each other. They perturb the space time and the gravitational waves travel all that way to us and left a signal in Earth detectors. Now, does this encounter sound familiar? Now we know that if two neutron stars encounter each other, they're going to perturb space time and their gravitational waves are going to reach to us. We're going to be able to detect them. We're going to have new elements and we're going to have a tons of neutrinos. So at the end of the day, what is this black hole has anything to do with making go? Okay, so this is what Einstein said. If we have curved space time, then light is not going to travel in straight lines. I can see you because the light that is being reflected from you travels in a straight line to me. I know you're sitting really there. Aston said that if it is a very massive object, like a black hole, I, cannot re I can see you, but I can really don't know if you're there. Light is going to be deflected by the space time around the black hole. The same happened to neutrinos. What I propose is that neutrinos get mixed with neutrons and protons, just as I said before, in these outflows of matter, but the amount of neutrinos is different and their energy has changed due to the black hole. So this is what we predict. These are the elemental abundances. The crosses are exactly the same bars in colors that I showed you before. If Newton had been an astrophysicist, a nuclear astrophysicist, he would have said space time is flat, nothing changed. Space and time are not correlated. And he would have predicted this black line that you see here. Einstein, however, if he had been a nuclear astrophysicist, would have said, okay, space, space time is curved. So neutrinos change, and then elemental abundances, gold being somewhere around here, will follow this other pattern. As you see, taking into consideration the space-time curvature can give us a much better prediction of what the element abundances is there. So indeed, the black hole is going to change how much gold, lead, silver we find on Earth. Now, isn't it breathtaking to know that everything we are was processed in stars? Wouldn't it be great to know that next time that two neutron stars encounter each other, we're going to unveil mysteries of the universe? There is a long way for us to go, but certainly new generations of physicists are going to help us to understand why is this happening. Thank you.